fellow travelers, and welcome to the Traverse of the Stars podcast. How are my loyal listeners? Thank you for your continued support. And as always, hit that subscribe button, everybody. An amazing show for you all, because born in the mothership is the legendary Mark Wade. You know him as the creator and writer of Irredeemable and Incorruptible from Boom Studios. This episode, we talk about the return of that series, Irredeemable, and the Netflix movie. Now come join me as we go traversing the stars. Hello, Mr. Wade. Thank you so much for coming to the Traversing the Stars podcast. A pleasure. It's a deep honor to talk with you. You are the writer behind so many wonderful things, and it's a very big deal to have you on the show. Uh, my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. So my first question is, um, you're a legend in comics. You've been writing fantastic work for uh, several decades. What keeps that fire stoked to keep on creating and writing? It's, first off, I love the characters. That's a big part of it, is that that it's just, there's so much a part of me that are like, I care more about a lot of them than some people I know. And so <laughs> I like being a part of that world. And, you know, as far as the rest of it goes, I mean, I just, I just keep trying to do better. You know, I just keep trying to think, okay, maybe next, the next script will be better. Maybe I can make this one work better. Mm. Maybe I've learned something since the last time I sat down to write a script that might come into play. So, I mean, that's an amazing thing to think about from, from where I'm standing. Cause once again, knowing your career and how um, how great it has been that you're still thinking to yourself, I'm not better yet. I need to get better. What little like improvements or things are you seeing in yourself that are, is getting better needs to be improved? Um, I think that I could be better with villain plots. I think that, I think that my hero plots are really good. My villain stories are always a little, a little shallow and I'm working on that. I think saying more with less dialogue Mm -hmm. is always something I can work on. But I mean, honestly, I was talking about somebody else. I was talking about this with somebody else this morning that, you know, the, the, the people who walk around thinking the creators who walk around thinking, Oh, I'm, I'm just the best. You know, I'm just, I'm at my, I'm at my peak. And, Mm. you know, I'm those, the guys who five years from later will not find work. Those are the guys who will just be littered, littering, littering the side of the roads because <laughs> you have to keep pushing. You have to keep, I, you know, I, I, I've come to terms with the fact that I'm good at what I do, which is a major step for me just to say that out loud. But there's always room for improvement. If there, if there wasn't, you know, then it'd be, it would be dull. Hmm. Well, your career, I mean, and you're, you've written for DC, you've mm-hmm. written for Marvel. You're running for one of my favorite companies, uh, CrossGen, that uh, I wave goodbye to every day. <laughs> uh, and you're running for Boom. So yeah. for in all these various companies and all the different experiences and what their expectations are, what have you taken and learned from working across all these different companies and what they've been asking for from their scripts and storylines? I've taken a couple of things. I, I take that regardless of the company, um, editors are people too. You know, they're not the enemy. They're your allies and, and trying to put together a good comic. I take from, I take from the, the breadth of it that stories are about people and not about things. Nobody cares about things. They care about people. And that there is a level of professionalism that is expected of you in this industry if you're going to keep making it. Um, keep, yeah, make it and keep making it. Um, and that comes with some flexibility in the sense that you want to hit your deadlines, you know, but at the same time, no one ever looked at a bad script and said, yeah, but it came in on deadline. <laughs> it, you know, sometimes you need that, you know, the, the work comes first. I mean, the thing that I guess it's a really long answer to a short question. And I know what this means is there's going to be 20 other questions that we don't have time to answer, but um all you have is your work. As a freelancer, at the end of the day, that's your resume, is your work. And so you have to be very protective of it, not to the point where you're a jerk, not to the point where you're not a good collaborator, not to the point where you're an asshole to your editors, but to a point where you have to be protective of that work. And mm. because at the because five years from now, again, no one's going to look back at some bad comics that you wrote and go, well, I'm sure they were badly edited. I'm sure they're fine. I'm sure he's much better than this. No, that's not how it works. So... How long did it take you to 
handle criticisms or feedback from an editor, especially ones that may not have been the most rosy? <laughs> it, I've had very few experiences with bad editors. Um, I found that most of the ones I have been lucky to work with are insightful. And if we disagree on something, it's always with a measure of mutual respect. Like, you know, and my feeling is also as a writer, like if it bothers someone, if it's, if it's not making sense to someone, if it's not making sense to my editor, then it's probably not going to make sense to some of the audience. Mm. So there's that. I've had very few, you know, experiences with an editor I just can't work with. <laughs> so now that um, you are one of the heads of uh, Humanoids as well, mm -hmm. How does that experience now that you're on the other side, you're, you know, not just the creator, but now you're um, a part of the editor staff and everything else. How have you taken that knowledge and now handled new talent with that knowledge? Well, I've, I've, I've always been part of the, I've always been part of the other side. I mean, again, I remember I came as an editor and since then I've been a publisher, a creative consultant, you know, a, 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 you know, a store owner. I mean, you know, an artist, an editor, a writer, a letterer. I've done everything that you can do in this industry. So I think that's part of what helps me do my job is I understand everybody else's discipline. Um, as far as the humanoids gig, actually, I left a couple of months ago. We haven't, I guess, I guess we haven't really officially announced this. I left a couple of months ago as the publisher, not because of anything acrimonious. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, we're still on good terms. I'm still doing work with them. It's just that there were so many other things going on mm -hmm. and and to be honest, I mean, having done it during a pandemic, it was not as much fun as it ought to have been. And it mm. wasn't as easy as it ought to have been. And that the stress of being publisher during a pandemic on top of all my other work was just too much. Mm. Well, you, um, you're you the creator of, I, I think, one of the seminal series of, 2000, of the 21st century and Irredeemable. Thank you. Um, it's one of those great series that people refer to, go back to. Uh, what inspired his creation and was it more a reaction to superhero comics or contemporary politics of the time? It wasn't really a, a response to contemporary politics. It was more, I mean, if anything, the origin story of it, and I told this before, and I apologize if you've heard it, but I mean, the origin story is Grant Morrison and I were sitting around one day talking about all the cool stuff in Superman's Fortress of Solitude. And we started talking about the Phantom Zone projector where he keeps all, you know, he projects all his evil villains into that. Mm -hmm. And I pointed out, that he has a something called a zonophone that allows him to communicate with these criminals and then i after a beat i thought who would want that in their house i grant actually grant has said who would want that in their house so they can where all they can hear is the invective and the anger and the rage and i said i already have it it's called the internet <laughs> and that sort of put in my head this idea of what if you had a superman level character who frankly just couldn't handle the emotional needs of being, I mean, he, you know, he's got the powers, but he doesn't have the makeup, the intestinal makeup, the fortitude to make the job work for him and to be that level of character because there's, there's too much self-doubt in him. There's, there's enough in there where he, remember, he can hear every criticism yeah. and there's always going to be a jerk. You know, there's a scene in one of the issues where he saves somebody on a yacht, uh, some billionaire on a yacht from uh, pirates and th their first response is, hey, who's going to clean up this mess? <laughs> Like, screw you, you know. Um, so that was that was the, the heart of Irredeemable, but it also gave me a chance to explore trauma. It gave me a chance to explore what your life would really be like if you were that powerful and no one tr trusted you. What if, you, you know, what if you were Superman and you were raised by somebody who wasn't the Kents? Mm. You know, what if you were raised by a, a, a crack mother who found you? In a, in a, and that's basically what happened in the Redeem right, one, right. and then everything else spills out from there. Yeah. So, when you're when you're thinking early on the story, did you conceive it as you know, let's take a look from a view of nature versus nurture that he was always destined to become what he um, a villain, or was there a path of heroism that he could have taken if things had played out differently, or if the world was just a better world that he came from? I don't think so. I don't think there was ever a path for full redemption for him. I don't, I, I just think that I deliberately stacked the deck so hard against him. There was not a chance. So is the flaw in him then humanity is the flaw in him or is he just so flawed that he had to go down that road? The flaw is, I mean, it's the flaws in the humanity in him again, it's nature versus nurture. Yeah. And 
And if you are all nature with zero nurturing, mm. then it's, it spells bad karma for you. That's not going to work out well for you. And I think another great character that you created that I kind of see some similarity or at least some connections to um, is the character Goga from Empire. Yeah. Uh, where and you mentioned in, I think it was the opening page of Irredeemable, um, you, you mentioned that Empire, the world of Empire is a world where hero, heroism just doesn't exist. It's a pure right. authoritarian world. There's no heroism at all. Um, Platonian exists in a world where there is heroism, that, but for him it failed. So mm -hmm. what would you say is the point of these two worlds where one world was without that heroes and the other one did have it? Was there good Gogoth form it in his own will and mm -hmm. because of who he is? Or was that also a world where something about it just didn't allow for heroism? No, it's, I think it allowed for heroes. It's just that that was not the focus I was taking. I, I never thought about it in that way. And that's a good question. It gives me something to think about. Um, I never really thought about it that way. I just started from Golgoth. I just started from what if the most powerful supervillain in the world actually won. Mm -hmm. And there were, you know, he knew five years in, he knew two things. Like he knew a, that he was going to win and B he knew he didn't want the job anymore, but mm -hmm. it's too late. He's already on the path because he knows he's learned as he, you know, starts knocking off his rivals and accumulating power. It really sinks in on him. Look, once you're at the top of the ladder, there's nowhere to go, and everyone is gunning for you. Mm. So one thing similar about Kogoth and Platonian, the Platonian, is that both of them are unhappy individuals. Mm -hmm. They do are not satisfied, even though they, in many ways, have accomplished what they wanted to for a, quite a bit. Um, what is about maybe the path of, I don't want to say evil, because I don't think they're necessarily evil, but that path that just leads to constant unhappiness or unsatisfaction? I think with both of them, it's that there's no, that their humanity is not there, that power without humanity is, will, will just turn you evil. I mean, there's, there's no, there's no path forward. That's good. And, you know, you know, I mean, you can see it around us in our world every day, people with power and no compassion, people with mm -hmm. power, and no humanity. And all they do is make the world worse. Would, would Gogoth have appreciated what um, Platonian was doing? If they had known each other, That's a good question. Um, possibly. I wish I had a better answer, but I've never thought about it. Let me get back <laughs> to you. All right, please. Yeah, come back to me. I would, I would love because Gogoth is yeah. such a great character as well, and would Thank love you. to have spoken to him for, about him for a while yeah. as well. <laughs> um, so the ending of the series suggests that Plutonian did seek redemption. Mm -hmm. Um, was as is it was that redemption always going to have to come from internally? Was it an ex um, an external um, redemption that he that he sought. How did you view that? It was always going to have to come partly externally. It was always going to have to, you know, the message of the series. Spoilers: the message of the series, which I had in mind all along. I, I had that last page of the series worked out a long, long time before I, I got there. Is that the? It just underscores the idea. The whole message is it underscores the idea that if you have this power without the proper nurturing then it's going to be destructive. But there is a world in which someone with this power can inspire rather than, you know, rather than destroy, can build rather than destroy. Did his need for redemption come from guilt or regret? Guilt. I don't think there's, I don't think there's any real regret in him. I don't think that, I mean, well, I mean, there's no regret in anything he's, I mean, there may be regret in the sense that as a young man, he wishes he hadn't shown as much of himself to his foster parents, a series of foster parents as he did. But that's not the driving force of him. It's more just the, the sort of bitterness and, and anger that comes with he was never embraced. He was never accepted. He never really felt truly loved. And then that when you couple that with the reality that uh, a you get the love that you think you deserve mm. and B we teach people how to treat us. You all factor all that into him. Then he was, you know, not driven by regret or even revenge. He was just driven by this deep loneliness. So when, when you look at his early life, you have um, a mother that you said, um, basically a crack addict, mm -hmm. um, foster parents that um, in many ways feared him. 
what then led him to want to try to be a hero to begin with looking at the world around him and thinking that these people as to his models are not worthy of that saving i think that i don't know that he ever thought they weren't worth saving i think it was more that he felt a calling and a destiny much like superman would much like most you know powered superheroes do uh but he just didn't know what to do with it i mean He's because again, and it also plays in the idea he's not relentlessly evil. I mean, he's not at core, you know, a, a truly heinous human being because otherwise he wouldn't have ever tried to help other people as the Plutonian. Yeah, uh, I think he certainly absorbed enough. And actually, there's a scene with one of the sets of foster parents that I think really ingrains upon us why he was helpful, why he felt. Like it was, you know, he had he had at least one good run at foster parents among the long series of really crappy ones he had. So, oh, uh, at, at the conclusion, um, well, that, was, that was planned from the beginning because basically, I think I read somewhere where you weren't exactly certain where it was headed when you started the first issue, but you did. You definitely had an ending in mind that this is where he's going to come up with. This is the redemption arc he was going to sought, and how the mm-hmm. different heroes were going to react to him. Yeah, early on, I had a, a pretty good idea of where we were going to land. I don't think I did with the very first issue, but I think pretty early on, I had a really good idea of what that last page would be. Yeah. Now, the last page is definitely open to interpretation of what mm-hmm. happens after without giving two, two spoilers. Well, maybe it's spoilers. Work. I mean, at this point, I'm sure everyone has read it. So maybe oh, spoilers. <laughs> 15 year old spoilers. OK, right. right. <laughs> so what's well, yeah, it's kind of vague and it kind of opens up the door to other versions of the Plutonian throughout, mm-hmm. I guess, uh, the multiverse. Yeah. Um, is that kind of where you're going to explore the next series of Irredeemable? Or is it going to be the original Plutonian? It's, I think that it would be a mistake to publish a comic called Irredeemable without some of the original Plutonian in it, although it's going to have to be mostly in flashback, I would think. Again, we're we're a ways off from figuring out how this is all going to work. Um but I'm not sure he's the focus. I mean, I'm, I'm, I think that it's as interesting to find out where the rest of the characters are 10 years on. Are you ever going to visit the other potential Plutonians out there? It's possible. I mean, it's, I, you know, I can't visit the one that worked because he's owned by a different company, but, (laughs) but there's, I, I would just have to have something to say about them. You know, in other words, I could do a, you know, multiversal parallel Plutonian out there, but I would have to find some hook to that character that wasn't nature versus nurture. I'd have to find some, and, and I don't know what that is. Um, would the other heroes welcome a attempt of redeemable to, uh, Plutonian to come back? No, they'd be terrified of him. Even if, even if the one that ended, cause he does end with the, at least the wanting of redemption. Yeah, but no, I mean, he's, it, they would be terrified of him. I mean, here's the thing. He's he's a live hand grenade, and they know this. And, I mean, that's part of what frustrates the Plutonian, right, is that people treat him like a live hand grenade, and so it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. He's He says more than once in that series he's really tired of people looking at him like he's a jack-in-the-box with one note left to go, you know. <laughs> um, and so I, I think that even the wisest of the uh, the paradigm group would – be suspicious so since you are bringing back irredeemable it was mentioned uh, announced by boom Mm -hmm. um why was now the right time to revisit it um and how has things in maybe your own life changed or did it all change how your perspective of the character of the plutonian i don't think it's really changed my perspective on that character but i do think getting back to what we were talking about at the top of the broadcast i think that i'm I'm hopefully a better writer. I'm, I, I know I've learned a lot about character writing in the last 10 years that I hope I can bring to the table. Um, I know this has to be a home run because I've said over and over again, the worst mistake you can make as a creator is coming back to something you already did yeah. be- because people are not just comparing you to your old work. They're comparing you to their nostalgia for your old work. So whatever Pete Krause and I do next with this thing, it, it's got to be a home run. And, and therefore, it's probably not going to be exactly the same kind of series because 
that all that would do was would accelerate people's uh, you know ability to compare it with what I've done before. Right, right. So I I'm not sure. Again, stay tuned. <laughs> I mean, that's a lot of pressure to put on yourself. Once you're, you're taking a, this great work and now you're measuring yourself up against this yeah. great work with this new work, are, are you a glutton for punishment? <laughs> is there a goal in mind? It, it, is, it is a lot of pressure, but it but it's I don't know. I don't know any other way to work. Again, like I said, if I just if I eased into this thing thinking I got this, then I don't. You know, there's a chance for me to fall down. There's a real. I mean, you know, pride goeth before a fall, and I don't want to be that guy. Um, and I've also found, like over the years, I, I, people ask me all the time, like, do you work better under pressure? And my answer is, I have no idea, because <laughs> I'm always, if I were under any more pressure, I'd be a diamond. Um, <laughs> And it always feels like that. So I, I, I have come to realize that in terms of my process, I think that's a feature and not a bug. I think that's just part of the process is I have to feel that, that pressure. Now, since you're bringing back Irredeemable, should we assume you're maybe eventually bringing back Incorruptible as well? I don't know. I mean, let's, let's see how the, you know, let's see how the new Irredeemable goes. Now, another rumor that I heard, and you can confirm it or not confirm it, um, is that it's being turned into a movie on Netflix. Is this still yep. true? Yep. Okay, so what is your role in this upcoming? Are you, you know, is it make it see like created by Mark Wade or is it show run by Mark Wade? It's it's not it's not that level of involvement, but it is a creative consultant, you know, position and stuff. And the the director um is is a huge fan of the work. The writer is also a huge fan of the work. We've had many conversations about what they love about it, what they like. And I really like their, their approach to, and, and their way of sort of condensing a lot of it into two hours without sacrificing what's there. Now the movie is going to cover the full uh, 37 issues of Eredema or is it going to be a, a storyline of it and then set up for the sequels. It's, I mean, it, there's certainly potentials for sequels here, but it really is focusing mostly on, you know, I would say, the first half of the series and, and getting to a resolution where if you're only watching this movie, you feel like there is a, you know, a, a payoff, a conclusion, but if you're not, you know, it, maybe there's chance, you know, if the movie's successful, who knows what could happen next. Has it been hard to give your baby up to another writer and let them do it? I mean, as you've been feeling like Twitch is like, nah, that's not how I would have done it. I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> nah, it's really not because I know this is a different discipline. I know this is a, a different medium and they're going to have to make they're going to be changes made there's no and they're going to need to be made because you can't tell a, you know let me do the math i mean you can't tell a 720 page story in a two-hour movie so mm. i get that i'm i'm fine with it i mean i feel like the writer respects what is there and in the work i've seen so far it's very faithful to the book and so i'm I'm okay with that. I would be a little more cranky if there was a robot dog in it just to put a robot dog in it. But so far, no, you know, so good. No, no robot dogs. Yet. <laughs> robot do that's, my, that's my litmus test. Do you put a robot dog in the series? Then I'm out. You know, there's probably a producer, a director, what a producer watching it right now going, let's cross that out. Yeah. Next time I talk to Mark, we'll wait for a movie. Robot let's cross dog out the, yeah, the robot dog. <laughs> um, so when you're thinking about the movie, the comic book as well, when you're looking at that in the movie, um, 2007 is when you started Irredeemable, my correct on the year. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. already been around the time when comic book movies started the golden age, kind of started around that 2007, 2008. Mm -hmm. Was it already looking at it from a cinematic point of view when you're creating it and it helps being translated into a movie because it's already been viewed as cinematic nah. lens? Nah, I'm not. I mean, I, I respect that there are people who do that, but I, I just can't bring myself to do that. I think that I want it to be a really good comic first and foremost. And then if it ends up being adapted into something else, that's gravy. But my only real concern when I sit down to write a comic book is, is this going to be a really good comic book? Mm. So, so what can our listeners look forward to next from you? Other than next Irredeemable. <laughs> uh, I know exactly. Well, you know, sometime next year, Irredeemable. But until then, I'm still doing uh, Batman Superman World's Finest over at DC and having a blast with, you know, classic versions of Superman and Batman having team ups and guest stars galore throughout the DC universe. Uh, we just announced that I'm doing a Batman versus Robin project at DC, Very where cool. it's, you know Batman, it's Bruce Wayne versus Damian Wayne. 
uh, for reasons that will become apparent pretty soon. Um, and there are other things. I mean, Brian Hitch and I have a Superman black label graphic novel series coming out at some point. I have to finish it. Not on Brian. It's on me. Uh, and beyond that, there's, there's just a bunch of different things that I have, uh, up in the pipeline. And I'm, I'm very lucky that way. I mean, I'm very grateful to the fans and I'm very grateful to the industry that I, after all this time, I'm still constantly busy, which no one could have predicted 40 years ago. Any chance of a Superman Platonian matchup at some point a crossover? I don't think so. I, I think that, I think that, I don't think those, those, I don't think I want to cross the streams. No. <laughs> Good Ghostbusters reference. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Okay. All right, my pleasure. You bet. Take care.